religious leaders, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. In August last year, the Loyang Tuapekong Temple shifted to a new location in Changi, near here. At a stroke of midnight, the big Tuapekong statue, together with other deities from the same temple, were installed on the new altar. It was a big effort, and I marveled at the skill of the forklift drivers who maneuvered everything into, into position with utmost precision. Many of us were so worried that it could be an accident. At about 1 a.m., a statue of Ganesha was also wheeled in. You see, the old Loyang Topekong Temple by the sea had, in addition to the Chinese temple, two other shrines. One, a Ganesha shrine, and the other believed to be the grave of a Muslim holy man, or Tato. It was therefore not only the Taoist deities which were transported to the new temple, but also Ganesha and the gravestones of the Tato. In fact, the Ganesha shrine is now a Hindu temple within a Taoist temple. When Ganesha was brought in that night, along the way, we stopped and turned 90 degrees to face Tuapekong, one deity acknowledging another before proceeding on to his final destination. One Chinese devotee remarked to me that the combination of Tuapekong and Ganesha was very powerful. Hindus, Taoists, and Buddhists in Singapore are generally quite relaxed about the mixing of religions. Christians and Muslims, in contrast, are not so comfortable because their beliefs are relatively exclusive. Many Muslims would not approve of a Muslim grave being located in a Chinese temple. So in the case of Loyang Topekong Temple, only the gravestones were brought across, not the remains of the Tato. On Kusu Island, which used to be an island to quarantine new arrivals from China a long time ago. Taoist devotees who visit the temple on the island in large numbers every year also stop by to say prayers and the Muslim Krama up a hill nearby. Chinese praying at the graves of Muslim holy men is an old tradition in Southeast Asia going back hundreds of years. We take the religious diversity in Singapore for granted. We are completely mixed in our neighbourhoods, in school and the workplace. It's not uncommon for temples, mosques and churches to be located side by side. Are there problems? Yes, of course, all the time. But we solve them in a practical way so that everyone has his own space to worship and carry out his religious activities. But everyone has to compromise a little. We must not assume that the religious harmony we enjoy is a natural state of affairs. In many parts of the world, religious strife tears countries apart. Such conflicts can easily occur in Singapore too, if we are not careful. To keep the peace, we must keep working at it, top down and bottom up. The government's role is absolutely important. Whatever our individual beliefs, we must always make sure that the state is secular, guaranteeing the freedom of all religions. The laws we enact must take into account the interests of Singaporeans as a whole, and not just of a particular religious community. We doubt the government of Singapore acting fairly in religious matters and being always seen to be fair. The religious harmony we often take for granted here would not be possible. From time to time, the government must act to defuse conflicts. For example, inflammatory films or publications may have to be proscribed or censored. It would not have been wise to allow publication of Danish cartoons of Prophet Muhammad here in Singapore, even though we know they could always be accessed on the internet. 
when pictures of Jesus Christ were put on the floor of MRT stations as advertisements for the film The Da Vinci Code, LDA had to step in even though the film itself was not banned. Some years ago, Taoist joysticks grew bigger and bigger until the government intervened. More recently, the requirement that all food in the school, tuck shop, be halal, became an issue which the education ministry had to sort out. All individual, Singap all individual Singaporeans may complain about particular actions taken by the government. On the whole, they know that the government tries to be fair and even-handed. <coughs> Religious leaders also play a critical role. Whenever possible, the government consults religious leaders so that whatever action that is to be taken is reasonable and not perceived as arbitrary or high-handed. Religious leaders sit on the Presidential Council of Minority Rights and on the Presidential Council for Religious Harmony. Whenever conflicts arise, their views are sought. Years ago, Muslim religious leaders agreed with MMD Kuan Yew to lower the volume of loudspeakers calling the faithful to prayer by having the calls broadcast on Malay radio station instead. And among themselves, religious leaders meet regularly, and many have become close friends. Sometimes they cooperate on projects, either to solve problems or to forestall problems. For example, the invitation to me as guest of honor for today's event, before the official invitation came, came through Habib Hassan of Ba'awi Mosque, who is here sitting on the front row. And sometimes our religious leaders also pray together, as they did for the victims of September 11 and the Boxing Day tsunami. When problems suddenly arise, they are able to contact one another directly. When Pope Benedict XVI made remarks about Islam, that could cause misunderstanding with Muslims in 2006. Catholic leaders in Singapore immediately reached out to Muslim leaders, soothing ruffled feathers. That was helpful. Over the years, the IRO, or Interreligious Organization, has played a vital role. Established in 1949, it is now composed of the 10 most important religious groups in Singapore. Important events, like the commissioning of SAF officers, their representatives in the IRO turn up to give their blessings. I would describe the IRO as one of Singapore's most precious social assets.